All right, thanks, Randy. So um, I'm Fabio Sanchez, and I'm going to be talking about the variational quantum eigensolver. Um, so as you heard earlier in the day from Adam, he gave pretty much a broad overview about a lot of the quantum algorithms that people have been interested in and been working on for the past few years. Um, and in particular, if you remember from his talk, there was a section on, on, on near-term algorithms that we were interested in. And that's really what this afternoon section is going to focus on. Specifically, I'll talk about the variational quantum eigensolver, and Asier will come up next and talk about the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. So the reason we're highlighting these two algorithms, and they pretty much get their, each get their own specific section, is because um, for near-term quantum computation, they, they show a lot of promise. Um, we still don't know whether or not they will provide some speed up, but we, we hope that they will, at least. All right, so you've already seen this quote, but I find it particularly important, so I'm gonna put it up again. It's the quote by Richard Feynman that Adam also put up. So it says that nature isn't classical, and if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical, and by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. And again, as Adam mentioned, um, Feynman was looking ahead at the time, and Feynman was a theoretical physicist. He did a lot of work in particle physics, and there's still a lot of particle physics problems, as well as quantum gravity problems, that we don't know how to solve, and they are, they are quantum mechanical in nature. So one of the best ways to tackle them computationally would be to have a device that sort of natively incorporates all these properties. So why did I bring this up when I mentioned variational quantum eigensolver? Well, it's because, as Adam mentioned as well, the variational quantum eigensolver algorithm essentially is an algorithm that we hope to use for quantum simulation. So what that means is that we want to use it to, to really simulate quantum systems that we are interested in understanding better. Um, now, Simulating quantum systems is very interesting for, phys for physicists, um, such as myself. We just might want to understand something because we find it interesting. But there are applications to industry as well. As a matter of fact, um, for example, the pharmaceutical industry could benefit from being able to more effectively understand um, properties of certain molecules. Um, and there's numerous other applications that in the, material world, in the materials world or catalysis that might also benefit if we could have an efficient system to just understand properties of various molecules or materials. All right, so I was talking about quantum simulation. I'll get back to that just a little bit more. So to emphasize, um, we expect that there's at least one application, even if we, even if all these other applications that, we haven't, that we've already heard about before, they don't really, if they don't work out, we expect that at least quantum computers will be able to natively simulate quantum mechanics better than anything else. And one nice thing is that the world is quantum. I mean, we've, we fundamentally believe that quantum mechanics governs the laws of nature. So if we actually could simulate this, we would in principle be able to understand a lot more things than we cur currently can. So here I have two pictures. One is the standard one that when we, when we hear about the variational quantum eigensolver, just some, some molecule. Um, this is really the, the regime where um, this algorithm is expected to be useful for, is essentially understanding properties of molecules, specifically maybe the, the energy states that for different molecular configurations. But um, being, uh, having done my PhD in quantum gravity, I, I couldn't help myself and also put put a little picture of a black hole because secretly I also have this desire that quantum simulation might help us understand a little bit more the fundamental properties of nature. Now, of course, in the, in the business world, this might not have immediate applications, but at least scientifically, again, this is another application for, for quantum simulation. Uh, maybe as a caveat, though, uh, a lot of what we want to learn from quantum simulation is in the Hamiltonian simulation part which is a little bit further out. And this talk, we will focus on the variational quantum eigensolver, which is, which is essentially um, applicable for near-term devices. 
All right, so as I mentioned, why is simulation important in the first place? Well, again, a lot of the world itself is quantum mechanical. Now, of course, the experiences that we have on a day-to-day -day life, those are classical, and there's a lot of work that goes into why that is and decoherence and so on. Um, but fundamentally, a lot of the, the material properties and molecular properties that, um, that dictate what goes on uh, in our bodies or in drugs or in materials, they, they come from quantum mechanical behavior of the um, atoms in, on the, in those materials. So being able to simulate them means essentially more effectively understanding these properties without having to do costly or, or um, very long experiments to extract these properties from these materials. So uh, as, as we know from uh, a lot of years of quantum chemistry, a lot of classical computation of these properties is intractable. That is, we, we do already have a large effort on using classical computers to numerically solve f for a lot of properties in these molecules, but th there are some obstacles there. So I'm going to talk about why that is in the first place. So Adam also mentioned a little bit about this. He mentioned uh, that quantum, mechanical, quantum mechanics has these funny correlations that can, that can emerge. So, so the name that these correlations go by is quantum entanglement. So you might have heard this word um, before. And w what, it really, what it really means is that if you have a quantum mechanical system that can be divided into specific subsystems, these subsystems can have these correlations among themselves that are really unlike any other classical correlation. Uh, the standard experiment that people talk about, or the standard setup that people talk about when, when, thinking, when discussing quantum entanglement, is essentially if you have two electrons, and we can think about these two electrons as having two separate states. We, we, we call these, these the spin states of the electron, but you can, you can really think about it as a qubit, which we've already discussed, a zero or a one. Now, classically, you know, either the, the two electrons are in one of the four accessible states, the 0, 0, the 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1 state. And if you know what that state is, then even if you separate those bits, you, you can essentially read them off, and they will be what, what they were, were always in, in the first place. Now, in quantum mechanics, you can create a little bit more of an interesting property there. You can create a state of these two electrons or two qubits where Essentially, if you, look, if you separate these two electrons and you look at them individually, before you look at them, there's just a probabilistic outcome. You can find a zero or you can find a one. And that might be true for both of the electrons, even if you separate them out on diff different corners of the galaxy, so long as you preserve the entanglement properties of those two electrons. So before you look at them, there's a 50-50 chance of finding a zero or a one. Now, once one person looks at one of them, they will, they will inevitably measure it, as was discussed, either a 0 or a 1. And they'll, we say that the state has been collapsed. Now it's a definite state. It's either a 0 or a 1. Well, the funny thing is, is that after that person has measured that one state as a 0, then the corresponding correlated electron on the other side of the galaxy or the other side of the room, it doesn't matter, will also have a definite state. This property, that we, this property has led people to speculate that one electron affects the other. I personally don't think that that's a good way to think about it. It's a little bit more subtle than that. Um, it's that. It's that they were just correlated in a quantum way. And once you measure the state, that quantum mechanical correlation enforces the fact that the other electron will be measured in the, in, in, in the state that was dictated by that correlation. And you can create that correlation in many different ways. Either they both can be 0, both be 1. If one is 0, the other one is 1. Or the, if one is 1, the other one is 0. It doesn't matter. Um, so why am I mentioning all this? Well, it's a little bit counterintuitive. And I don't expect to explain quantum entanglement in five minutes. But the idea that I want to get across, is, and as Adam mentioned as well, is that 
essentially classically keeping track of quantum entanglement is, is pretty difficult. It, it, it essentially requires some computation of, of the full quantum system, and that is a hard problem to do classically. However, quantum computers are natively quantum, so they can natively implement these correlations directly. OK, so great, correlations happen in quantum mechanics, but what does that mean for material simulation? Well, it turns out that these quantum mechanical correlations, they're not a special property that was engineered for this, these particular states of the electrons that I was just talking about a minute ago. Um, as a matter of fact, if you, uh, uh, being a little bit vague here, if you sort of generically take a quantum state that can be divided into subsystems, if you, I haven't defined what generic means, but if you do that, if you, if you ignore that, sec, if, that for a little bit, and you look at the entanglement properties of that generic quantum state that you've gotten, it will generically have a large degree of entanglement, which really suggests that so long as systems can at some point interact in some way, quantum mechanical, uh, the quantum mechanical laws of evolution will dictate that later on these, the systems that have come together will inevitably be entangled. As a matter of fact, um, one example of this, we were talking about molecules, which is really one of the, the main applications for, this, for quantum simulation in industry. Um, if we want to find the ground state for, um, for the electron configuration in molecules, we actually expect that ground state to be one that is entangled. So here I have a, some pictures of some orbitals. Um, what that means is that those are the, more or less the quantum mechanical configurations for the, the electron structure in, in a simple atom. Now, th those are these are just simple orbitals for, for something like the hydrogen atom. But when we're interested in computing the electron configuration for more complicated molecules, such as the molecules that are, resp that are responsible for interesting bio, um, biochemical behavior in, in our bodies, um, we, we, it really would help us to understand the chemical properties of them to really understand what is the electron configuration state of these molecules. And it turns out that, as we expected, these molecules are quantum systems, so the electron configuration state that is relevant is one that is entangled in the first place. So classically doing that computation, and essentially this is one of the fundamental reasons why computing these properties classically is hard, is because you have to keep track of, of that exponential dimension of, of the space of states that is allowed by quantum mechanics to understand what the configuration the electrons are going to be in. All right, so now, now that we understand that quantum simulation is hard, what can we do about it if we have a quantum computer? So one of these algorithms that was near term, as we've been discussing, is called the variational quantum eigensolver. And let's state the goal of, the, of this algorithm in, in very simple classical terms. So ideally, we want to find the actual energetic configuration for some molecule. Now, finding that energetic configuration can be useful because it will tell us a lot of interesting chemical properties of that molecule. So it turns out that Finding the exact energy configuration is still not necessarily tractable in near-term machines, or at least we don't know how to do it. But if we're happy enough with a good enough approximation of the lowest energy state of some molecule or some general quantum system, then we can use the variational quantum eigensolver. So the goal of the variational quantum eigensolver is to obtain an approximation for the energy of a given configuration and also that configuration. So how do we do this? Well, again, I mentioned that the variational quantum eigensolver is an algorithm that will run on near-term machines. But near-term machines have limited coherence time. That is, we can't run arbitrarily long algorithms on it. So the way to get we get around it, as I'll discuss a little bit more detail in, in a couple minutes, is that we use these hybrid classical quantum algorithms. That is, we run short circuits that are still allowed by the coherence time in our quantum device. And then we use the output of that circuit to understand a little bit more of the properties of the system. And then 
and then essentially g generate an, a rule to update the parameters appropriately. So what that means is that what we're essentially going to do is just make a guess. And the initial guess might be very simple. We're going to guess what state do we think that the molecule, um, what state do we think is the lowest energy state of the molecule we're interested in calculating. And then we're going to say, OK, let's simulate that state in the quantum computer and then measure the energy. And then, and then we want to minimize that energy. What that means is that we say, what if I vary that guess a little bit in a given direction? Does that energy go up or down? And we can essentially apply gradient descent from then on and minimize the set of parameters that we've used in our guess. All right, so I've, talking, I've talked a little bit about molecules, but then all of a sudden I started talking about a quantum computer. So one thing that I've skipped over so far is the fact that molecules are not the same thing as qubits on a quantum computer, at least not naively. However, so what that means is that you effectively have to do a transformation from the space of states that are available for a molecule into the space of states that quantum computers can simulate. So what I've called that here is a mapping to qubits. So what you have to do is, once, you've understand, once you essentially um, formulate your problem as a molecular problem, there are certain ways that you can transform that problem into a quantum computational problem where instead of applying electron interactions between the electrons in a given molecule, you apply quantum gates. And there are well understood ways of doing that, but that is a part of the process. So here's this essentially a summary of what the variational quantum eigensolver is. So we start with a given molecular definition, or more generally, a given definition for a quantum, for a quantum state of a quantum system. And then we, what we say is, OK, we're going to make a guess on what state do we think is going to be the one with the lowest energy. We use the quantum computer to prepare that state. So essentially, we apply, we initialize our quantum computer. We apply a set of gates that is going to prepare the, the state that we've guessed. Then what we're going to do is measure essentially what that state is. And we might have to repeat that a few times, because what we're really doing is calculating some expectation value of the energy in that state. Now, that calculation, that calculation is now becoming classical. Classical. Every time you measure the state, it becomes a classical computation of the expectation value. You iterate a few times until you're happy enough with what value for the energy you've gotten. That value is fed into a classical optimizer. So this can be a standard gradient descent, although we expect that we're, we're still exploring, essentially, what types of classical optimizers might work best for, the, for these purposes. And then the classical optimizer, as expected, generates an update rule that feeds back into the parameters that we use to make a guess for our state. And we prepare another iteration of the state, measure its properties, and then feed back at, into the classical optimizer. Eventually, we've, we reach some convergence criterion, or we're happy enough with the, the energy we've gotten, and we stop that process. And the solution is the expectation value is essentially an estimate of the, ex of the expectation value of the energy of that state. What in addition to that, we also know the parameters that we've used to prepare that state. So in other words, after we go through this loop enough times, we, achieve, we, we extract from it an approximation to the lowest energy state of the system. And in addition, we know how to prepare that state in the first place. So we can use, we can use it, for example, to measure some other properties that we may be interested in. All right, so here's a summary of how we go through the variational quantum eigensolver. First step is we have some quantum system or some molecule, and we have to map that quantum system into a configuration of qubits. The next, the next step is to then make a parameterized guess that we're going to use to, and, and run on the quantum computer to prepare the state that we're guessing. Parameterized means that we have to have some freedom in there to update these parameters to minimize the energy. This is an important point. So, what we've done here is essentially offload a computational di computationally difficult task, one that might involve, for example, a lot of quantum entanglement in that state, into something that natively does this. Once we've, once we've parameterized this guess, we can essentially run the circuit many times and obtain an, expectation, an approximation for the expectation value of the energy. 
the observation that we make is then fed into this classical optimizer, which generates an update rule, and we go through the loop until we've achieved some convergence. All right, I've mentioned this point again. I've mentioned this point already, just, and I want to emphasize it. So VQE is a hybrid classical quantum algorithm. As we saw in the diagram, what that means is that part of the algorithm is run on a quantum computer, and part of the algorithm is run on a classical computer. This is an important category of algorithms because, as we've seen earlier, quantum computers really have, in the near term, will have limited capabilities. This limited coherence time only allows us to, do, to run a circuit that's only so deep. So as we'll see, as well as Asier's talk, another important algorithm for the near term is also a hybrid classical algorithm. So these, he, these hybrid algorithms are very important for the near-term qu computing devices. And just to reiterate, the goal here is then to offload computationally intensive tasks that are natively done better on a quantum computer into the, quant into the quantum circuit and then use the results of those com computationally intensive tasks into some other classical part of the algorithm. All right. So this was a lot. And instead of essentially going through all this yourself, at QCWare, we've made an implementation that makes it easy for you to run this algorithm. So what our implementation does is it takes as input a certain molecular configuration. And I'll show that in a second. So for example, the explicit example I'll show is for hydrogen. So what you'll feed into the algorithm is just a molecular configuration, which is a list of atoms and their positions in space. Then you make a call to the QCWare client, which connects to our server, and we run this algorithm. We essentially will connect to some quantum hardware, we'll make this parameterized guess, we'll apply some update rule, and then after some convergence is achieved, you, we just return the energy. So again, our goal at QCWare is essentially to make these quantum algorithms easily accessible to everyone. And I think we're going to run essentially a demo, which is just going to be a video of a Jupyter notebook um, that, that does this that I, just, th that I just described. So maybe we can run the first video right now. All right, so essentially the first, the first step is to just import some standard libraries, and more importantly, our physics library, which has the fine ground state energy function. What we do next is then the geometry data um, variable essentially describes a hydrogen molecule with a separation of 0.74 angstroms. It's oriented along the z direction. We then run, um, maybe we can run it again. It was a little short. Um, can we pull up the video one more time? Thank you. Um, so then we just run the fine ground state energy function our algorithm takes care of the mapping, the connecting to a quantum computer, parameterizing the guess, and doing the classical update. And what it outputs is our estimate for the energy of the hydrogen atom at, at a separation of 0.74 angstroms. OK, so let's formalize this a little bit more. We can run the second video now and do a little bit more fun computation. So now we're going to see how does the bond distance, the distance between the two, um, the two hydrogen atoms, affect the, um, the bonding energy. So we've just now created an array of distances, and we're going to create, we're essentially going to f cal do that same calculation many, many times for various distances. And what we do is just plot the result. And here what we see is the the energy of a given hydrogen uh, molecule configuration as a function of the distance between the two hydrogen molecules, the two hydrogen atoms, apologies. And you know, we, the, the, minimum of that, of that, the minimum energy of that uh, energy versus distance graph is the stable configuration that, that the, we expect the hydrogen uh, molecule to be in, at least at zero temperature. All right. so. That's it. I'll leave some, some room for questions later.
Yeah. Hi. Oh. Uh, wait, okay. There's a question here. Was there another question? In the while you get a microphone, maybe. Yep. Wait. Someone over here. Right here. Okay. Um, so this is very interesting. But what's the application result at the end? Okay. So you ran this code and you showed it to us a few times, and I guess you ran it statistically enough times to get that result, right? That graph. That that's right. Well, yeah. More or less. Every run of our algorithm already runs enough times to get a statistical, okay. a statistical significant result for a given point, but yes. So the practical application at the end, besides demonstrating the graph, there was more than that, I suspect. I'm just not sure what that... Well, okay, so for, hydrogen, for, for a hydrogen molecule, to be fair, we already knew that ahead of time. It's too small to, do, to, to gain any benefit from a r real quantum computation, but... Um, the, the, what we expect is that once we have large enough quantum computers that are powerful enough, in principle, we can put in, a, we can put in more, more configurations of more, com uh, more complicated molecules and find the appropriate configuration and the appropriate energy. Where, there. where do you stand now in terms of the complexity of the molecule? I mean, is it close to somewhere where it could be uh, used by the pharmaceutical in industry or some? Uh, depends on what you mean by close, I guess. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, the, the order of magnitude is maybe with 100 qubits, we can do some, mo some specific molecules that are not, track not tractable to, do to be done classically. But it, it, those molecules' applications to the pharmaceutical, personally, I don't know. Um, I don't believe that those first molecules are going to be useful for many materials. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, it, that just figuring out what parts of molecules and what molecules to simulate in the first place is, is another difficult task. And really, really, someone that's working in the field has to analyze their problem to see how to do that. Um, so we're, we're a little bit ways away, but m maybe around the slightly over 100 qubits, but you know, 300 to 1,000 qubit mark, we can, we can find some interesting results. Maybe there was a question here, another? Or oh, he had a question, sorry. Maybe you can just ask it. I'll repeat it. Uh, so the question was, uh, when you map the molecule to the qubits, do you just take the tensor product of the electron states? Um, so there, there's a few different ways to do this, this mapping. More or less, you can think about that each qubit is associated to some orbital, and it's either occupied or unoccupied by a given electron state. Um, so does that, does that answer your question? And then the actual mapping, you have to enforce commutation relations between the, between the, uh, the operator, the, essentially the qubit operators and the anti-commutation relation of the electrons. Is, there's two questions here, so. Hi, I just, it's super fast. I, I don't know if you already said it at the beginning of this, but basically um, when you are working with the classical Hamiltonian of the known molecule that we're interrogating, and then you want to move from the classical Hamiltonian to the quantum Hamiltonian, the difference there, right, is like instead of looking at the P and Q variables, you're looking at the Hermitian operator. Does that happen? Like, did you mention that this um, is like the advantage of the system? Like, are you translating from like a classical to a quantum Hamiltonian or... Um, well, so actually, the way that I think about it is that the Hamiltonian for, for the molecule is a, is a quantum Hamiltonian in the first place. So it's, it's a Hamiltonian of, elect well, there's various terms in the Hamiltonian. There's kinetic energy of electrons, kinetic energy of the nuclei, which you might, you might, you can simplify that away if you assume the nuclei are fixed at some, in some fixed space. There's the electron nuclei interaction and electron electron interactions. Um, I think the best way to think about this is that this is a quantum Hamiltonian between interaction of electrons, which are quantum, uh, they're quantum mechanical particles. So they're always a quantum mechanical particle. I think we think about them classically because it maybe simplifies some calculation, but truly what's always going on there is quantum. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm happy to talk about it more later as well. And maybe we can get one more question in before. Oh, thanks. Um, so you use your example there, which is you know the fairly classical hydrogen bond strength thing. Now, yeah, uh, and it's kind of nice that you did that because it allows to you know frame a question that, that I wanted to frame, which is to say you know Google and IBM have both published results you know doing that simulation. I think by a far a rather more direct 
uh, mechanism. I don't believe that either of those teams were using VQE uh, for their published results. So I was curious how you would characterize the advantage of using VQE for that trivial case. I mean, did it allow them to do fewer measurements? Did it allow them to have, did it allow you to successfully simulate with lower quality qubits? What was the advantage gained in this particular case by VQE? Um, in this simple case for the simulation, I'd say that there's really no clear advantage. Um, probably there's a disadvantage there. Um, the, the hope is that for larger systems, it may be a little bit easier to do this with VQE. The, the truth for answer is that we don't know yet, but um, there are different ways to do simulation. And as a matter of fact, even in the VQE state preparation, there are different things you can do there. And if you, if you really do the, the standard preparation that, that is often proposed, which is called unitary couple cluster, um, the depths associated with doing that preparation are really not amenable to near-term devices. So you already have to do some, some, some legwork there to, to essentially use this algorithm in the first place. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. But for this simple molecule, the answer is actually there's real, no clear advantage, except that we're demonstrating this algorithm. And, and, and that's nice in of itself. Uh, is your question if we were to plot better, like more complicated molecules, are we going to see? Right, yeah, that, that's what we expect, yeah. Um, I think we're out of time. I'm happy to chat more later.